changed because of this virus? Well, I no longer go to the hospital. Um, I no longer hug. I no longer shake hands. And for a hugger, uh, it's a killer. Uh, but we are surviving by the grace of God. Uh, it has changed my life in a way of reading more scripture uh, and trying to understand God's word better. Now, will I ever get proficient? No. But at least it's a start. I have come across a verse in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, the 12th verse. I must have read this 40 times, but I can't get it out of my mind. For those who have a relationship with Jesus, they have the power to become children of God. Isn't that powerful? Gina? Well, I think mostly it's just uh, messed up my daily routine. I'm used to a daily routine. I miss uh, seeing my grandchildren and my family, hugging my sister. Um, so prayerfully, we'll get back to our, our normalcy soon. And I think uh, the way I've gotten through this crisis is with the help of my husband, uh, praying together, praying alone, seeking God's advice, seeking each other. And um, day by day, God will take care of us. I can't wait to be in corporate worship again. Oh, so if yes. you're not a hugger, stand by for heavy rolls to starboard because you're going to get a hug and a handshake. Love you all. Bye-bye. about three different things and first one is for me taking personal responsibility during this season making sure that I have an awareness of what's going on in the news but more importantly that I am really seeking the Lord with that information and really putting it through his filter so I know how to pray for my kids my family my family that is across the United States um, also to make sure that when Thank goodness, Larry and our daughter are still working in the workplace. We want to make sure that when they come home that they are very clean. So asking them to pay, take personal responsibility for their hygiene and that they're showering and that they're using hand sanitizer and washing their hands, which I think that's what we're all doing, but them more specifically. Um, the kids and I have been home. Our routine hasn't really changed that much. We are pushing forward with classes just like all other moms. and and all other families right now, our routines. Um, and also just trying to set a Christ-like example under pressure because there are some pressures that are unique to us as parents. Yeah, and you know, for me, a lot of it is has been to keep perspective and to, um, I, I, not to be too simplistic, but I think that things boil down to fear or faith and um, and there's a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of uh, medias out there that are uh, fear mongering uh, and spreading fear. And, and so that can be contagious, but so can uh, hope and love and uh, 
trusting God and, and building our faith. So I really um, hope that uh, I can lead in that way in our family and in the workplace uh, because there's no doubt that fear and anxiety is, is high and, it, and there's plenty of resources for that uh, kind of thing, for fear and anxiety, but there's also good resources for faith. And, and that's one of the ways I'm dealing with that is looking for those uh, encouraging uh, places online through different podcasts, through different uh, YouTube posts, through our, our own church uh, encouragement through Pastor David uh, with daily Facebook uh, prayer and, and, and just gathering together, be, being able to connect with uh, friends on, on the social medias and on the phone and family too. Another way is to make sure that we are working as a team. That is something that's really come to the forefront, that we are working as a team, as a family. If one of us doesn't want to work as a team, how it breaks down the process of either, you know, not spreading germs, you know, as a mom, I need to make sure that little ones are washing their hands, but I also have to make sure that we are working towards the goal of being able to stay connected with my parents, for instance, to be a caregiver should they need need help and um, with that breaks down then it really causes a barrier for us to be able to get to them and them to us so that's something that I am very aware of that we're protective of each other that we're praying for each other very specifically in this season um, that we ask God how does he want you to use us in these days to really be a light for him right where we are even from home so he's got something to say about that We've never all been through this before, but God has, and so He wants to share with us if we're willing to listen. Third, I would say just being aware of the trouble that's out there, but not being overcome by the trouble that's out there. Not letting Satan get a foothold in our minds and in our behaviors and our attitudes and in um, the places that really everyone feels fear in, like Larry's workplace. So we just want to say hello to all of you and we miss you terribly and we are praying for you. We want to stay connected so feel free to send us a text or give us a phone call or connect us on Facebook and social media. Um, also we are just glad to be a part of this community and glad to be a part of our church family at Park. Yeah. And just you know, keep praying. Uh, God is going to see us through this. and. There's no doubt that when we go through a crisis, especially an extended, uh, unique, unprecedented crisis like this, that uh, we really need to just we need to turn and go deeper and press even further into our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in, in our daily walk with Him. So let's let's keep going deeper with Him. All right. Have a happy Easter, everyone. Well, this is certainly a unique experience to be here with you, but not here with you. Um, I never in all my wildest dreams thought that we would have an, an Easter like this. And I know that as you're sitting there at home, hopefully comfortable and, and uh, doing well, that this time, even though it has been challenging and, and for many a very stressful time, I, I hope that you are able to draw close to Jesus and that um, you are using this time to focus in on your relationship with him you know we are here to celebrate the risen lord and to give honor to to jesus and even though our our world is in in a, a weird way right now due to the the virus and the stay-at-home order and all of these sort of things the reality is that christians for centuries have been celebrating what Jesus accomplished on that first Easter Sunday. And we are able to um, 
set aside what's going on in our lives because what Jesus accomplished overcomes anything and everything that could or will occur in our lives. We look to Christ and what he did when he rose from the dead as the sign, as the signal um, that nothing in this life will hold our God back. And so I hope that as we celebrate Easter today, as we sing and as as the message is, is preached here in just a few minutes, I hope that you will just be focused on Jesus and on what he accomplished more than what's going on around us at, at this time. So God bless you, and I hope that, that you are able to really just worship our Lord. sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began was redeemed only beauty remains and my orphaned heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you a savior displayed on a criminal's cross darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose without freedom in that's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made 
made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began, that's when death was arrested and my life began. Well, this morning we have the wonderful opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I think it is especially appropriate as a part of an Easter service that we stop to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, Easter is the celebration of the fact that he rose from the dead. But um, before that, he had the cross. And so it's very appropriate that we celebrate what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And this is a remembrance service. And it's a memorial celebration. And so let's spend just a few minutes remembering what Jesus accomplished did for us so that as we participate in this, uh, this will be fresh in our minds. First of all, remember that he left heaven and all of the glory of heaven to come to earth. Philippians 2 says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Jesus set aside deity. And not only did he set it aside, but he took on the lowest position possible. He gave up his divine privileges and he took a humble position as a slave. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. So let's remember that Jesus set aside heaven and and all that that entails to come to earth to be just an ordinary, lowly person. Second, Jesus came to show us God's love and his mercy. He came to show people that God cares about them. God cares about you. Luke 4 says in the spirit that Jesus is speaking, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free at that time at the time of the Lord's favor has come let us remember that God cares about the lowest people he didn't just care about the rich and the powerful no he came Jesus came to to reach to the the lowest levels of society the people who were the most down and out He calls each of us to a personal relationship with himself. And so that that should be great news for us. That should be something that that people are are really drawn to. But the reality is, is that, that many people hated him and rejected him because we love our sin and we love our rebellion more than we love God and more than we love righteousness. So let's remember what Jesus did. He gave up heaven, he gave up his deity, and he took on the lowest form, uh, you know, not just a, a human, but a, a lowly human of, of low birth. Bible says in Romans 3 that no one is righteous, no, not even one. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. No one does good, not a single person. So let's remember that Jesus came to us 
We didn't come to him. He came to love us. He reached out to us. We didn't reach out to him. And Romans 5, 8 says, But Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And by this, God showed how much he loves us. So Jesus paid the penalty for my sin and and for your sin. And he's the one that stepped up. He took the, the brunt on his shoulders. Only God in human form could accomplish what Jesus did. So as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, let's remember what Jesus accomplished and what he did on our behalf. Philippians 2.8 says he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. So today, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're remembering this. We're that Jesus died a horrible death on the cross, not because he was bad. He was God. He is God. He is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. But he died as the sacrificial lamb offered up. He died for each of us. And my question for you is, did he die for you? Have you accepted his death as your sacrifice? He died for anyone who will believe that he is God in the flesh. And he died for all who will believe in him. So this morning, as I I read, then he broke bread in pieces And he took a piece and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took a, excuse me, the same way he took a cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for what you accomplished on the cross. We celebrate your victory over sin and over death. We remember you and we remember what you accomplished. Only you could do this. And so we thank you. And it is in your name and your name alone we pray. Amen. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own You 
bountiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. There exists a love far greater than we will ever understand. Love prophesied for ages. Then to disrupt the rain of darkness. One to challenge the skeptic. our thirst. Seeks after the sick. And mends the broken. A love that came to our rescue. Despite our betrayal and our denial, we bore the way Facing death by being nailed to a cross. And while darkness appeared victorious, this love emerged from the grave.
Well, happy Easter, everybody. I am so glad that you have joined us this morning uh, for, for this wonderful time of celebrating Jesus rising from the dead. Uh, in 1967, the, the rock group The Doors had an album that they entitled Strange Days. And I think that they, we are certainly living in some strange days right now. And, um, you know, I, I hope that as a follower of Christ, you are recognizing the labor pains that, that Jesus spoke of um, referring to the last days. I'm not saying that um, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but I hope he does. Um, but just know that these are signs of the times, and we need to live appropriately with our eyes fixed on, on our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, seeing as we are here to celebrate Easter, I want to bring up something, the, the point of Easter. Easter, for so many people, has just become a tradition. Uh, you know, you go to church, you have ham, and, you know, you do an Easter egg hunt, and it's just something we do. But did you know that Easter really has a, a most significant point to it? You know, the, the point of Easter is to make it possible that we know that we are going to go to heaven or not. Uh, did you know that that's what Easter really is about? You know, I, I have a question for you. Are you sure that you are going to heaven when you die? You know, are you absolutely certain that you're going to heaven when you die? I, I um, Some people will say, well, I, I think so, or I hope so, or I guess I am, or I want to go. But did you know that you can know for certain? You know, hoping and wishing really it isn't good enough. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to be a jerk when I say this, but it's rather foolish to go through life and not have that most important question settled in, in your mind. Uh, you know, um, I, I don't know if you've heard the news or not, but the mortality rate in the world is 100%. Um, we're all going to die at some point. And, and I'm not trying to be morbid or anything like that. <clears throat> but the question it, <clears throat> that we have to, to know, that we have to have settled, is what's going to happen after we die? Well, let's settle that critical issue today. Um, you can be absolutely confident and know for sure that you're going to go to heaven after you die. I, I, I hope that if you didn't know that, that your ears have perked up and you're really clued in at this point that this is, this is an important message. The whole point of Easter was to settle that issue. When Jesus rose from the dead, there was the proof that the world needed that a person could die and live again. Jesus is our model. Jesus is the one who made it possible. And if that sounds good to you, then, then let's get started. We're going to spend today I, primarily looking at one Bible verse, and it's the most famous verse in all of the Bible. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the middle word. There are 25 words in that verse. And the middle word, the 13th word, is the word son. That's Jesus. Now notice the first 12 words are all about God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Son is that middle word. And then the last 12 words are all about you and me. That whoever or whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That in itself is, is a picture. 
The Bible teaches that God's on one side and mankind, humanity is on the other. And Jesus Christ came to earth to bring us together, to, to fix the, the divide, the chasm that exists between God and humanity. Uh, Jesus is the mediator, if you will, between God and, and humans. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take this verse phrase by phrase and we're going to break it down and understand what this is really telling us. And again, if you have any doubt in your mind whether when you die you're going to go to heaven, by the end of this message today, I hope that you will have it answered. That you know, I, I my intention is to answer anybody's doubts or questions on whether they're going to go to heaven when they die. Well, the very first thing, there's four pieces to this. The very first thing is that we must recognize God's love. If you want to go to heaven, the first thing you have to do is to understand, to recognize God loves you. John 3.16, the very first phrase is, God so loved the world. Now, that's not to just recognize it intellectually. We need to understand it. We need to appreciate it emotionally. We need to experience it. The Bible tells us that God is love. It doesn't say that he has love. It says he is love. <clears throat> it's his nature. It's his character. It's what he's made of. It's his DNA, if you will. So, the Bible says that everything in the universe was created by God for his enjoyment so that he could, he could love it, so that he could engage with it. That's why everything exists. The planets, the animals, trees, all the plants are, are there so that God can enjoy his creation and that he could love. <clears throat> and... The thing that you need to hear very personally today is God created you so that he could love you. He made you to love you, to have a relationship with you. It's the whole reason all of us exist. <clears throat> the Bible says God so loved the world. That means that his love is extravagant. It's, it's lavish. God, God loves you on your good days and on your bad days. He loves you when you're feeling it. And he's loving you when you don't feel it. He, he loves you when you're doing the right things. And he's loving you when you don't. Maybe you're saying, well, why? Why is that the case? Well, God's love is not based on you. And it's not based on me. It's based on who he is. God is love. God's love isn't based on what you do. It's not based on your performance. And here's the key. It's based on what Jesus has already done for you. God chose to love you unconditionally. Even a thousand years before you or I were ever born, God knew that on Easter 2020, you would be sitting at home because of the coronavirus. He knew you'd be there and that he could get you to sit still long enough so that he could tell you this, I love you. God wants you to understand that. He loves you. God made you to love you. He saw you formed in your mother's womb. He, he saw all the good and all of the bad of your life. He saw all the right and all of the wrong. And he still loves you. God so loved the world. John first excuse me first John 4 verses 9 and 10 says God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world that's Jesus so that we might have eternal life through him this is real love he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins God didn't just say he loved you he showed it 
He proved it. He sacrificed his son. When Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and he died for us, what he was saying, what he was communicating is, I love you. I love you so much that I am willing to die in your place. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 1, what an incredible quality of love the Father has that he has shown us that we should be permitted to be called and counted as the children of God. <clears throat> Humans are different than animals. I, I hope you understand that. The Bible says that we are created in the image of God. That's why you have a spiritual nature to you. That's why you have a conscience. That's why you, you are able to tell the difference between right and wrong. You're able to have compassion. You know, that's why you have the ability to pray. You can talk to God. The Bible says that God created people so that he could have fellowship with us. God wants a relationship with people. He wants a relationship with you. The Bible, Bible it, it, over and over again, talks to this specific issue that God has this deep passion, this love for each and every one of us. Now, maybe things are going a little shaky in your life right now, and, and you're, you're feeling kind of out of sorts, and maybe you're you're struggling with the fact that you're getting kind of banged around by by life right now well in first peter 2 4 it says come to christ who is the living rock the cornerstone on which god builds this is important to understand that if you want stability in your life if you want a sound foundation it's going to be found in jesus christ it's going to be found in your relationship with him. You know, when, when life gets crazy and it seems like you're losing your footing, the anchor point, the, the cornerstone of your life must be Jesus Christ. And, and this is what it means to, to feel, to, to have a real encounter relationship with Jesus. You know, we don't want to just have head knowledge about God. We want to have that personal relationship, that personal experience with Jesus so that when, when we're dealing with the hardships of life, we have a real, honest, legitimate anchor point. And intellectual knowledge about God isn't, isn't going to hold us. It's that personal connection with Jesus that makes the difference as we go through the, the tough times of life. That's God's love. You know, so the very first step we need to understand is that we need to recognize God's love. Nobody is ever going to love you as much as God does. The second thing we need to understand is that we must receive God's gift. That's the second part of John 3.16. The first part says God so loved the world, that's recognizing his love, that he gave, that's the gift, his only begotten son. <clears throat> Did you know that God has a gift for you? That's why we give gifts at Christmas, because God gave us the very first Christmas gift. He gave us himself. He came to earth in the form of a little baby. He wanted to, you know, if God had wanted to communicate with ants, he would have come as an ant. If he had wanted to communicate with cows, he'd have come as a cow. But God wanted to communicate with humans, so he came as a human being, as a little helpless baby. Now, notice it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice that it doesn't say that God sent a good man or that God sent an angel. And it doesn't say that God sent a prophet or that he sent a moral and ethical leader. No. God sent the very best. He sent 
his son. He, he came to earth in human form. His name is Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 24 and 25 says, Out of sheer generosity, God put us in right standing with himself. A pure gift. In other words, you and I can't earn this from God. It is a gift. It is a gift that is called grace. Grace is God giving you what you need, not what you deserve. If we got what we deserved, <laughs> none of us would have any hope whatsoever. He got us out of the mess that we were in, and he restored us to where he always wanted us to be. There's the heart of God. He did it by means of Jesus Christ. He sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Why did Jesus have to die? You know, sometimes that people struggle with that. They don't understand that. Romans 5, 6. When we were unable to help ourselves at that moment of our need, Christ died for us, although we were living against God. I don't want anyone to misunderstand this. This is a really an important portion of this message. The first thing that we need to really understand is that none of us are perfect. None of us are right. We have all blown it. We've all done things that we regret. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say we've all done some things that we should regret. And maybe we don't regret like we, we ought to. The Bible says it this way, we have all sinned. We've all done it. We have all rebelled against God. We have all struck out at God. But God is not just a loving God. He is also a just God. That means that he's fair. He's righteous. He upholds the law. And so when someone breaks a law, there is a penalty for that law. And the Bible says that all have sinned. And then it goes on to say that the cost, the wage, the penalty of sin is death. We all die physically, but there is also spiritual death. That means that I deserve to be punished for the things that I've done wrong. And that's bad news. That's, that's not a good thing. But the second half of that verse, here's good news. Everything you've ever done wrong in life has already been paid for. That's what Jesus accomplished on the cross. He took my sin and he took your sin and he took it upon himself. All of the sins that you haven't even committed yet. The sins you're going to commit later on today and next week and next month. And the sins that you've never even thought of yet. Jesus took those sins on the cross. They have been paid for by Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And one of the most amazing verses in all of the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5.21. It, it's called an exchange verse, if you want to look at it that way. Because it says, God took the sinless Christ... And again, understand, Jesus never sinned. He's God. He was perfect. And the verse goes on and says, poured into him all of our sins. All of the things that you and I have done wrong. And then in an exchange, and here's the great exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. That's good news. What this is saying is, is that God is going to take everything that David Blakely has ever done wrong and ever will do wrong. His meanness, his rudeness, his selfishness, all the times he's lied, all of the things I've ever done and will ever do. And he's going to take everything that I've ever done and everything you have ever done, and he's going to put that on Jesus while he is hanging on the cross. 
And he is going to pay the penalty. Jesus is going to pay the penalty so that I don't have to. And here's the exchange. He's going to take the goodness, the righteousness, the perfection of Jesus. And he's going to put it on me. And if you are a follower of Christ, he's putting it on you. God is in essence saying, I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to pay the penalty. That way it's fair and it's just. Sin is, sin is accounted for and the penalty of sin is paid. But it, at the same time, it shows God's great love for, for each and every one of us. If there was any other way that, that a person could get into heaven besides Jesus Christ and what Jesus did on the cross, then God wouldn't have wasted his time with sending Jesus to die on the cross. That, that would have been an unnecessary thing to, to happen. But you can't find your way to heaven except through what Jesus did on the cross. Now, none of us are perfect. You may be better than me, but none of us are perfect. And God doesn't grade on a curve. You're either perfect or you're out. It's a gift. It is a free gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That gift uh, it, where he died for us so that we can go to heaven that's called grace. I just received this gift of God's grace. And I don't deserve it. I never will. <clears throat> Romans 11.6 says, Since salvation is by grace, it is no longer by works. If it were by works, grace would no longer be grace. Do you know the difference between religion and salvation it doesn't matter what religion you are. If you know, I know you're watching via some sort of, of social media right now, and so there may be a lot of different people with a lot of different religious backgrounds. It doesn't matter what religious background you are. Religion is man attempting to get to God. But we're talking about salvation here, and salvation is what God did for us. You can summarize all of the religions of the world with one word, do, D-O. Each religion has their own little list of to-dos. You know, you got to do this, you got to do this. The difference between religion and salvation is salvation is based on the word done. It's already done for you. It's a gift. When Jesus died on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. It is finished. What does that mean? It means that he paid for all of the bad things that you have ever done, that I have ever done. And it is the only way. It is a gift. It is finished. You can't add anything to it because it's only by grace. Now the third step is knowing to know for sure that you're going to heaven is you have to respond to God's offer. First you recognize God's love. God so loved the world. Then you receive God's gift that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Then you respond to God's offer God made an offer to you in love. It is a personal offer. It is specific to you. That whosoever believes in him will not perish. God says, if you do this, I'll do this. The promise of heaven is, whoever believes in him will not perish. Notice that who this offer is for. The Bible says it is a free gift of eternal salvation offered to whosoever. Whosoever. That means me. That means you. It means anybody who will step up and say, I want that. I accept that. It doesn't even matter what your religious background is. 
You could be a Muslim. You could be a Mormon. You could be Jewish. You could be Buddhist. You could be an atheist. Heck, you might even be a Baptist. It doesn't matter. Jesus Christ still died for you. Your religion is not ever going to save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. It doesn't matter what you have been in the past. You can be the most horrible, horrible person that ever lived. Jesus still died for you. Your past is past. What matters is what you are becoming right now. Notice how you accept God's offer of eternity and, and eternal life into heaven. Romans 3.22, God says he will accept us and acquit us. That means free us. He declares us not guilty. And, and if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in the same way. By coming to Christ no matter who we are or what we have been like. <clears throat> Aren't you glad <clears throat> for that last part? No matter who we are or what we've been like. Friends, there's only one way you're going to get into heaven. By trusting Jesus Christ. Trusting. There's, there's the key. What does it mean to trust Jesus Christ? That means to cling to him, to rely on, to adhere to. It means that you commit yourself to Jesus. Trust God in every area of your life. You trust Him with your finances, your relationships, your future, your dreams, your ambitions. You trust Him with your talent. You trust Him with your problems. You trust Him in any and every detail of your life. That's what it means to really believe in Jesus, to really trust Jesus. The world is full of people that have head knowledge about God and about Jesus. There's no salvation there. It's when you place your life in his hands and say, you are going to guide me. The Bible says, whoever believes in him shall not perish. A lot of people know about God, but they don't know God. You have got to know him. It's the difference between your head and your heart. Knowing him personally, having an ongoing day-to-day -day relationship with him. That's what it means to trust God. You can go to church your entire life and still miss going to heaven. Knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. If you want to go to heaven, you have to recognize God's love, you have to receive God's gift, and you have to respond to his offer that whoever believes in him. And then there's the fourth thing, you have to rely on God's promise. What's the promise? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. One day, your heart is going to stop. And that'll be the end of your body. But it's not going to be the end of you. God made you in his image. You were made to live forever. And God wants you to spend forever with him, in, in a relationship with him. But here's the bottom line. If you want to spend the, your eternity with God in heaven, you have to have a relationship with him now here on earth. You know, you can't thumb your nose at God and say, I'm going to ignore you my whole life. I'm just going to give you lip service. I'm going to go through the motions. But I'm not really interested in connecting with you, God. But, oh, by the way, when I die, I definitely want to go and spend eternity in heaven with you. It doesn't work that way. You have to develop a relationship with Jesus and, and come to God through Jesus now. 
You say, well, what if something were to happen along the way? What if I mess up along the way? Can I lose my salvation? No, because your salvation isn't based on your being good enough or your your efforts. It's based on your commitment to Jesus. When you say, Jesus, you are my only salvation. I am trusting you and you alone. Then, and only then, are you moved into a right relationship with him. And 1 Peter 1 verses 3 through 5 says, we are now members of God's own family. In other words, when we put our trust in him. And God has reserved for his children the priceless gift of eternal life. It is kept in heaven for you. And God will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting him. You see, when you make an authentic relation. Uh, 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 When you give yourself, you begin to trust Jesus authentically, you're not going to want to walk away. You may go through periods where you're you're not as as committed as as other times, but you're never going to walk away and God's not going to let you walk away because he loves you and he cares about you. He will see to it that you walk with him today. Why not put your trust in Jesus Christ? God loves you. Do you understand that? You know, if you understand that God loves you, then accept his offered gift of salvation. It's only possible uh, you know, it, through God's Son, Jesus Christ. There, there is no other way that you can come to God. Accept the gift by placing your life in God's hands. It, it's, not, it's not dependent on you other than to accept the gift that God offers. He will make sure you get to heaven. It's, it's not by works, it's by grace. So I'm asking you right now, what are you going to do with Jesus You know, you can either trust him, you can commit your life to him, or you're going to turn and walk away from him. Either way, there are eternal implications and consequences. Jesus said, come with your doubts. Come with your questions. That's that's okay. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have your, your theology all in a nice, neat order. I've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, and there's still things that I don't understand. There's still things that I'm, I'm sorting out. But that hasn't stopped me from having a friendship with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. I don't have to understand everything. I'm not God, and neither are you. We're never going to understand it all. Don't let this moment pass without knowing for sure that you're going to heaven when you die. Now we're going to close in prayer here in a minute. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer that if you want to ask Jesus to come into your life and you want to commit your life and begin to trust Jesus, I'm going to lead you in, in a simple prayer. There, there's nothing magical about the prayer. It's just a way of expressing what, what ideally is on your heart. And then also, if you know, since you're watching online, there's a connection card. We have the connection cards here in the church. But if you are making a commitment to Christ, or if you're struggling with questions, or you have prayer requests, fill out that commitment card that's online and submit it. And at the very end, I'm going to give you my phone number. It's my cell phone number. And if you need to talk Call me. I, you know, uh, there's no no harm if you're struggling and and you have some questions and you have some doubts. I'm going to give you my number so that you can call me and we can talk about it and we can work through this. There's no reason to be embarrassed. Everybody that comes to Christ has to talk to somebody at some point. So as we close. Would you just pray a a simple prayer in your heart and and in your mind? You know, you don't have to say it out loud, but you're certainly welcome to. God knows what's on your heart. 
He's, he's seen every thought that, that you have ever had. But you could just pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I want to thank you for loving me. I want to thank you for coming to earth for me. I want to thank you for giving your life for me so that I can go to heaven. I want to accept your free gift of forgiveness, your grace. I know I can't even earn my way to heaven. So I want to learn to trust you with every area of my life. Would you make me just as if I had never sinned? Then help me to know your purpose for my life so that the rest of my life is the best that I can be for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now there's one last verse, that, and it's talking about what it's going to be like in heaven. And there's going to come a day again where all of us die. And God says, I'm going to take you into heaven. And I, if you put your trust in my son, Jesus. <clears throat> and this last verse says, we wait for that day when God will give us our full rights as his children, including new bodies he has promised us. Did you, did you know that? Bodies that will never be sick again and will never die there's going to come a day where, where there's no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears, no more problems of any kind. And so we live our lives looking forward to that day and we celebrate Easter because Jesus is the picture of what's going to happen to each of us who have trusted Jesus. I hope that you have the most awesome Easter you have ever had, and especially if you have just today accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the best Easter, the best day of your life. Praise the Lord. Good day.